I'm going to call the City Council meeting of August 20th, 2013 to order. Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh. Here. Kenyon. Here. Petty. Here. Tennant. Here. Schottmeyer. Here. Adam. Here. Long. Here. Gray. Mayor Jordan. Here. Just join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Under the City Council meeting presentations, reports, and discussions, items we have the second quarter financial report by Paul Becker <coughs> you're oh, on Paul <laughs> All right, Aaron Council. Uh, second quarter report on the finances and uh, right now everything looks pretty well on track sales tax is up about 3.8 percent that's this is through June for the first six months of the period uh, county sales tax is up 4.3 percent so that's just about two percent over what we had anticipated in the budget other than that uh, one thing I do want to point out is our uh, in water and sewer fund water sales are way down compared to last year but we remember thank heavens we're not where we were last year with the sphere drought so the sales should be expected to be down. Building permits are down a bit because of so much permitting that went on last year that we're seeing the results of the construction right now. The uh, one thing I did want to point out also is in airport right now, our fuel sales are a bit soft. We're getting that all straightened out. We're going to see how that checks out in the future, but we're going to, that's something we're going to keep an eye on future. Other than that, everything looks pretty well on track on what our expectations were. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. I have one question. Yes. Um, what do we collect per mill for our property taxes? What do we collect per mill? Yeah, how much is a mill worth in Fayetteville? About 1.2, 1 1.3. 1 yeah. How much is it worth in some of the other communities here in Northwest Arkansas? How much is it worth? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't extended that. It's worth less here than it would be in other communities because of the, uh, so much of the, uh, of the university is exempt. Okay. okay. So... It's all dependent on what your assessed value is, Matthew. So many of the cities don't have the number of exemptions we have here. Okay, thank you. But right off the top of my head, I, I, I don't have the inf information. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Paul. All right, under agenda additions, we have a walk on tonight from the staff. Uh, the NEA Our Town Grant and Contract with University of Arkansas will entertain a motion to add that to the agenda. So moved. Second. So we have a motion and a second to add that to the agenda. Uh, Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh. Yes. Kenyon. Yes. Petty. Yes. Tennant. Yes. Shopmar. Yes. Adams. Yes. Long. Yes. Gray. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, as this is an ordinance, I will read the ordinance. This was, of course, emailed to all of you all last week. In order to accept a grant from the National Endowment of the Arts in the amount of $100,000 for a streetscape design project on School Avenue to approve a technical assistance agreement with the University of Arkansas to design this project, to approve an agreement with the Walton Arts Center for its contribution of $40,000 in matching revenue plus personnel services to assist in the project, 
and to approve the attached budget adjustment. Whereas, with the assistance of the Community Design Center of the University of Arkansas, the City of Fayetteville, in conjunction with the Walton Art Center, applied early this year to the National Endowment of the Arts for an Our, Our Town grant to fund a streetscape project to incorporate art, landscape, and sustainability within infrastructure improvements on School Avenue from the Walton Arts Center to the Fayetteville Public Library. And whereas Fayetteville's grant application for $100,000 was one of 59 requests to be approved out of over 250 50 submitted applications. And whereas the Community Design Center of the University of Arkansas has, proven, has a proven record of unique and specialized knowledge and ability to design such project that it envisioned and helped prepare the grant application for, and whereas the Walton Arts Center was a required partner for this grant, and will provide additional funding as well as expertise to make this artistic streetscape design project successful. Now therefore be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas, Section 1, that the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas hereby accepts with sincere appreciation to the National Endowment of the Arts its Our Town grant in the amount of $100,000 and approves the attached budget adjustment. Section 2. That the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas hereby determines that because of the unique and vital abilities of the Community Design Center of the University of Arkansas to successfully design and fulfill the goals of this project, and for other reasons as stated above, the City Council determines that it would not be feasible or practical to follow the normal bidding requirements and therefore waives the formal bidding requirements and approves the attached technical assistance agreement with the University of Arkansas, Section 3. That the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas hereby determines for the reasons stated earlier that the formal bidding procedures for the agreement with the Walton Arts Center would be impractical and not feasible and therefore waives those formal bidding requirements and approves the attached agreement with the Walton Arts Center. Don, do you have this? Yes, I do, Mayor. Um, first, I want to thank the Council for adding this to the agenda tonight. Uh, this item is a very time-sensitive agenda item. Um, we received the award of this grant, um, but we required some contracts to be signed with the University of Arkansas, uh, with the Walden Arts Center, and in order to get those contracts uh, in place for you to have before you tonight as a consideration is why we weren't able to meet the prior deadline. If we aren't able to get this approved and forwarded on, then we risk losing $100,000 towards this design contract, which is why it's before you tonight. Um, First in January, the City Council uh, approved for the city to apply for the grant from the National Endowment of the Arts, um, Our Town Program, which requires a nonprofit and a government entity to partner. Um, we received earlier word this month that we were awarded $100,000 in those grant funds. Uh, the title of the project is called School Avenue Integrating Art, Landscape, and Sustainability, and it begins to describe the comprehensive and collaborative nature of the project with our partners, the U of A, uh, University of Arkansas Community Design Center, the Walton Arts Center, along with artist Stacy Levy. And um, I had the clerk's office send you some examples of Stacy Levy's uh, work as attachments to this agenda item that incorporate uh, the items that we talked about. Uh, the grant will fund an art integrated streetscape design project for School Avenue in downtown Fayetteville. This grant does not fund construction. Uh, design but as any project that we would do um, design would be a component of it so this is a way to get us money towards um, getting this work done for us the project area is anchored on either end by the Fayetteville Public Library and the Walton Arts Center on the other end which combined draw over 500,000 visitors annually the project connects the cornerstone institutions with local um, National Public Radio affiliate, uh, the Hillcrest Towers, which is Fayetteville's largest public housing facility uh, for the elderly and disabled. And as your Title VI coordinator for the city, um, having a streetscape that is ADA accessible and handicap accessible is extremely important in this area because of our public housing uh, location. One of the concepts of the design projects will be to leverage art to promote greater pedestrian activity, uh, linking these nodes of activity and the public social spaces together in a meaningful and very interactive way. Uh, the grant will be used uh, to design a transformation from downtown School Avenue into an artscape with public art serving a dual purpose um, as infrastructure. 
The item for the council is an acceptance of this grant award in the amount of 100,000 and a contract agreement with the University of Arkansas and the Walton Art Center to facilitate the project completion. Uh, the city will be involved with in-kind match of staff time dedicated to collaborating input and review throughout the project. The Walton Art Center is contributing both a cash match and an in-kind match, and the university is contributing in-kind match in the design consultant's time for the project. Um, staff recommends approval of this uh, request. What questions, comments we have, Council Matthew? Um, you all received a letter in your packet too uh, detailing my relationship with the project. Uh, for full disclosure, I'll describe some of that verbally. Uh, I work about 10 hours a week for the University of Arkansas Community Design Center. Uh, I was intimately involved in developing this grant application. Uh, I wrote it, conceived it, vetted it, and built the partnerships. Um, I'm not going to be paid out of this funds. I'm not on this project at all anymore. My role there is to write grants and to conduct research. It's not to design on these projects or to manage these projects. If I were in a role like that, uh, I, we wouldn't be able to accept this grant or, or, or I would have to quit that job. Um, so because I'm not in any of those kinds of roles and because I won't be paid out of these funds at the design center, uh, I don't have to recuse but I'm choosing to abstain uh, for political considerations. I want you all to know my relationship there. I want the public to know my relationship there and of my work there. Uh, but I want this grant to stand on its own. I think it's a fantastic idea for Ward 2 and for the city of Fayetteville in general, for the public housing entity that's there, and uh, for all the citizens and the visitors that enjoy downtown. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about the grant or about my relationship at the Design Center uh, from you or the public. Okay, what are the questions we got? Our comments. Okay, what uh, public comments do we have? Okay, I'll bring it back to the council. Mayor, I'd just like to say thank you to Alderman Patty. I think this is a wonderful idea and appreciate the fact that you came forth and talked about this a little bit tonight because I knew you worked in the center, but I didn't know exactly what your role was in this. Um, and I appreciate very much your looking forward and thinking about ways in which we can get money like this. And I think if we have to spend a little money on it after it's designed, then fabulous, let's do it. And I appreciate you very much, Alderman Petty. This is an ordinance, right, Kent? Need to us. Uh, if we want to pass it tonight, we're going to. I'd like to move that we have that. On this. Suspend the rules and go to the second meeting. Go to the second meeting. <laughs> All right. We have a motion and a second to go to the second meeting. Sandra, would you please call the roll? Mark? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Petty? I abstain. Tennant? Yes. Shotmark? Yes. Adam? Yes. Long? Yes. In order to accept a grant from the National Endowment of the Arts in the amount of $100,000 for a streetscape design project on School Avenue and to approve a technical assistance agreement with the University of Arkansas to design this project, to approve an agreement with the Walton Arts Center for its contribution of $40,000 in matching revenue plus personnel services to assist in the project and to approve the attached budget adjustment. I move we suspend the rules second. and go to the third reading. We have a motion and a second to go to the third and final reading. Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Shotmar? Yes. Adams? Yes. Long? Yes. In order to accept a grant from the National Endowment of the Arts in the amount of $100,000 for a streetscape design project on School Avenue to approve a technical assistance agreement with the University of Arkansas to design this project, to approve an agreement with the Walton Arts Center for its contribution of $40,000 in matching revenue, plus personnel services to assist in the project, and to approve the attached budget adjustment. Final comments from the council. Thank you all Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, if there's no other comments, Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Shotmar? Yes. Adam? Yes. Long? Yes. Okay, under the consent agenda tonight, we have number one, approval of the August 6, 2013 city council meeting minutes. Number two, Mitchell Williams, Sleg, Gates, and Woodyard. <coughs> PLLC amendment number one, a resolution approving amendment number one to the contract of Mitchell Williams, Sleg, Gates, and Woodyard, PLLC, in the amount of $15,000 for additional legal services related to the White River 
quality standards petition to the Arkansas Pollution Control and Ecology Commission. Number three, number 13-41, Jack Tyler Engineering of Arkansas. Resolution awarding bid number 13-41 authorizing a contract with Jack Taylor, Tyler, I'm, I'm sorry, Engineering of Arkansas in the total amount of $58,760.15 for the purchase of four return activated sludge pumps for the Nolan Wastewater Treatment Plant. Number four, bid number 13-44, Pfizer Kubota. Resolution awarding bid number 13-44 and authorizing a contract with Pfizer Kubota in a total amount of $165,173.75 for the purchase of four irrigation reels for the city biosolids management site. Number five, Bill and Doris Kaiser settlement agreement, a resolution approving a settlement agreement with Bill and Doris Kaiser concerning condemnation litigation filed as part of the North Crossover Road Utilities Improvement Project in a total amount of $13,950. Move we pass the consent agenda as read. We have a motion and a second to accept the consent agenda as read. Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Patty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Shotmar? Yes. Adam? Yes. Long? Yes. Okay, under unfinished business, number one, RZN 13-4410, 2468 North Crossover Road, Linwood Estates. In ordinance rezoning that property described in rezoning petition RZN 13-4410 for approximately 4.66 acres located at 2468 North Crossover Road from RSF2 residential single family two units per acre to RO residential office subject to a bill of assurance. I will entertain a motion to go to the second reading. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to go to the second reading. Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Hetty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Shotmar? Yes. Adams? Yes. Long? Yes. An ordinance rezoning that property described in rezoning petition RZN 13-4410 for approximately 4.66 acres located at 2468 North Crossover Road from residential single family two units per acre to residential office subject to a bill of assurance. Andrew, do you have this one? I can answer any questions uh, the council or if you guys have. Well, is there anything new or anything? There was a revised rezoning request submitted. The applicant is proposing to rezone the property to what's called neighborhood services, which is a little less intense than residential office. To uh, what, I'm sorry? It's called residential or neighborhood services, and it's a, a smaller scale uh, <coughs> form-based zoning code. And I can answer any questions. Absolutely. On that particular subject, I meant to ask um, last week, uh, do we have any examples of that exact zoning <coughs> existing right now and existing right now in Fayetteville? I don't believe we have any on the zoning map at all. Okay. Well, Ron. Do we have a recommendation from the staff on the change to request? I think staff's recommendation, is, we, we have some similar concerns that we had with this application as with the residential office and primarily just the concern of um, not being consistent with the future land use plan map. So we're, we're not recommending in favor of this. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Andrew, when, did, when did we pass the form-based code? The very first form-based code was adopted with the downtown after the downtown master plan and then the zoning followed that probably Five years or so ago. So neighborhood services about five years ago, 2008? No, neighborhood services followed in another, we have, we've had multiple changes to our zoning codes since that and neighborhood services was probably adopted really, you know, just in the last two years or so. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. I, um, to answer, maybe to expand on Alderman Tennant's question, which is a great question, I think that may be why we haven't seen any of that. You know, we haven't seen very many development permits at all come through, except for with several big projects in the last few years. Um, you know, we haven't even seen very many residential office permits come through in the last two years either. Um, so that may be why we haven't seen it. But I think we should trust it more than residential office. Um, and here's why. You know, it seems to me, I've read all the letters and comments we've gotten from the neighborhoods out there. Uh, you know, we even got another round of petitions today. And uh, it seems to me that the biggest concern is uh, that a commercial development will go through 
similar to the property to the north, which a lot of neighbors have seen happen and are not particularly pleased with, um, ranging from aesthetics to noise and, and other concerns. And, uh, you know, whenever we, whenever this item first came to the council and we were hearing those concerns, uh, I thought maybe there was an opportunity to do something a little bit different because neighborhood services hadn't been tried before. And, you know, part of it is I just, well, the main difference between neighborhood services, I think, in this scenario is that if a commercial development does come through, and I don't think the property owner has any, um, has any specific plans or a buyer yet, um, but if a commercial development were to come through and ask to buy that property, it would have to come back for a conditional use permit to the Planning Commission, whereas if we approved a residential office request, uh, it would never have to come back. It would just go through an administrative development review. And it seems like, to me, this was a good middle ground, which is why I reached out to the property owner to see if they were interested in neighborhood services, because it allows them the flexibility to move forward with multiple ideas for the property, but it also requires them to vet any commercial ideas, again, with the Planning Commission. And the conditional use pr process means that they would have to have a development pro proposal in place so it would be reviewed at the same time as a conditional use permit, which we're not able to do with rezoning proposals. It would give the neighborhood another chance to, uh, to, to have comments. Uh, they would have to be notified again, and it would give staff the opportunity to uh, develop conditions of approval. That is the conditional use process. That's the main point. So I thought it was a good middle ground to allow us to say we've heard the neighbor's concerns and we want to address them in a substantive way, but to also say uh, maybe we're tired of Fayetteville's reputation of not wanting to be business friendly at all. And so maybe this is a good middle way where we can be business friendly and do what the neighbors want because it requires any commercial idea to come back through. Okay. Um, and I have a question um, for you, Alderman Petty, on this. Uh, this what this particular zoning seemed to come out of the downtown master plan ideas a few years ago and with that being said it seems to me like that this particular zoning would fit better in a downtown area or uh, maybe in an area where you had a mix of of smaller residential and maybe smaller areas that were turned into small office complexes and things like not office complexes but maybe houses and then maybe a house that's turned into an office nearby other commercial buildings or commercial businesses and i i wanted your opinion on that is this does this fit better in that sort of space or do you think this fits in a what i would consider a, an area over there which is large areas large you know lots with residential homes all over it Okay, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, first, I challenge your premise that even though maybe the downtown master plan drove a lot of these discussions, I think if you read the 2030 plan, and maybe Andrew would like to com on, comment on this as well, uh, we want to see um, these form-based codes go in most places. It's not about a downtown style of development. It's about an appropriately scaled style of development. So I do think it works in other neighborhoods in general. Um, your question about crossover specifically, um, you know, we're all going to have a different opinion on this. Um, personally, I think this is probably the first of many requests to come through for crossover road now that the road has been widened. And personally, while I may think there are better places for a commercial style development or a mixed use development, if I was putting my money on the line, I don't feel like I'm being fair if I turn something down for that reason without having, uh, uh, without having something articulated to say this is where we want it. And we don't have that right now, not really. Uh, the future land use map that's been quoted um, is very blunt, very broad. Uh, it's open to interpretation even in this area. And I think to your larger point, planning isn't about today. Planning is about the future. It's about what we want to see at the township intersection and adjacent to it. It's not about what's there today. It's about what making sure happens over the next 30, 40, 50 years become, is compatible to begin with and remains compatible. And that's not something we can do by continuing to segregate land uses. 
we can't do that. We have to figure out how to mix them in a way that makes sense. And that's why I think neighborhood services works better than any other zoning district here, because it requires a more detailed review of any kind of commercial development proposal, which would mix things. But with neighborhood services, instead of like, you know, with residential offices, it would be commercial development by right. With neighborhood services, it puts a limit on the scale, which I think if it were to happen, people would want the scale to be limited. They don't want a 40,000 foot grocery store to go in there or a 40,000 foot office building. Um, they want to see something that's appropriate if they want to see anything at all. Uh, and it would require that second review with the actual development proposal in place instead of having this abstract conversation about zoning, which doesn't really dive into the details that most residents would want to be able to dive into. I understand, and I, I appreciate that. Um, and I think if if we had to rezone this, if if God Almighty came down and said, you've got to rezone this land, this might be a better option. Um, but there's still the question of whether it needs to be rezoned or not. Certainly. Um, and whether or not 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now, the best use for that land is not exactly what it's zoned for now, which is single family residential. But that's a bigger question. But I, I, I appreciate your point because I was, when I read the zoning, I was a little bit confused. I kept thinking, this seems to fit a little better in other parts of town than that. But I do appreciate your um, your opinion on that. I have one more question, if I sure. can. And this is to um, staff. Do we have an idea from the highway department of when they're going to open the south side lane or lanes of traffic on 265? Yeah, I'll let the city engineer address that. Thank you. Uh, the project won't be fully complete probably till about November, but the actually splitting the traffic so it'll be flowing on either side of the median is imminent. They're, they're tell, telling me maybe even by the end of the month. So pretty soon that um, in order for folks to access the other side of the uh, get to the other side of the road, they will have to make U-turns at the, the median breaks. Uh, so within the next month, I would say for certain we'll see that. Okay, thank you. For now, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a question for uh, Andrew. Um, if you could tell us uh, what type of services are allowed in the neighborhood services. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, thank you for the opportunity. I would like to correct some of the comments I've heard talking about mm -hmm. this zoning district. I have it pulled up here, not that you can read all the lettering, but. Um, and you can see under neighborhood services, this is a, a pretty new zoning code. It does allow for commercial uses by right. It does not have to go through a conditional use process, but they are limited in scale as Alderman Petty indicated. You can see under the permitted uses it lists use unit 12, which is limited business. So you could build an office of up to 3,000 square feet. Um, and there's different categories and scales, like if it's a restaurant, it could be like 1,000 square feet, different things like that. Okay, thank you. Matthew, you had question. Yeah, um, it was my understanding that the applicant was uh, keeping their bill of assurances in place. Is that correct? I haven't discussed that with the applicant. Maybe he could clarify. Okay. Was that correct? Mr. Israel or whoever the applicant, Mr. Rogers. We, we've included the bill of assurances. But you'll have to step to the microphone. They can't pick you up. Okay. I've been Israel. 1501 Star Drive, Fayetteville. Uh, we agreed that with the re request for rezoning that we would in include the bill of assurance. That's what I thought too, so thank you. Yeah. Um, so I apologize for being imprecise earlier about the, the, about the commercial uses, but because of their bill of assurances, uh, that would not allow use unit 12. It would only allow on, commer on the commercial side use unit 25, which is a conditional use up there. So I apologize for being imprecise, but because of their bill of assurances, the only commercial use unit that would be allowed is unit 25, and that is a conditional use permit. Um, well, I was considering making a motion because it seems like even though staff doesn't recommend it, they think that this would be better, more appropriately scaled, even though they don't fall down on the side of supporting it. Um, it seems like if God Almighty force us to rezone, it might be the best zone. So I'd like to make a motion that we amend this so that we can discuss it in that context. Do we have a second? Is the 
Just for the amendment? Yes. Yes, so just yeah, for I'll the second the amendment. Okay. And motion is second to amend to uh, neighborhood services, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Now well, let's discuss the amendment. Can I ask a question? If, if, if we amend this to neighborhood services tonight, are, are we going to wait till the next city council meeting so that we can take further input from citizens before we vote on this? Well, that would be, I think, a decision for the city council to make. It doesn't have to go back to planning. Mm -hmm. just no, I, mean, it's, I knew that. I mean, I'm just saying that yeah, about, right. some people have asked yep. if you change that, then does it have to go through the process again? And it and doesn't now, have to. Now rests in your court. Right. Okay. Right. Further on that question, everything we have in our packets from public has been based on the other. That's without correct. Without right, the petitions, that's everything correct. that's not been considered. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Let me just try to clarify what we're trying to clarify or what we're looking at and how long it's been in the public's ability to view as well. Mayor, if I could just make a comment. We did receive calls uh, in the mayor's office today that if a rezoning change for this item was requested that um, the people who have been sending you uh, documents requested that it stay on the second reading uh, so that because they have not evaluated the criteria of neighborhood services uh, and they'd like for that to be done. So. Obviously, we can't make Thank that you. commitment right. in the mayor's office, but wanted to pass along their request. Now, Kit, the amendment will have to be yeah. voted on now that there's a motion and a second, correct? Tonight? It doesn't have to be voted on. It certainly can be tabled, but I mean, it, you know, before something would need to be done to this particular motion before you right. can get back to the, the more general uh, discussion. Yes, absolutely. The only way the people could know whether or not to put a name on a petition for a new zone. They'd have to we, understand. We would have zone. to understand yeah. it, but, but we, we would have to change it to that rezoning so that they can understand. And so I'm fine with doing that, and then, but I do suggest we leave it once we do that, whether it goes that way so that people can get more time. I just assumed you all would hold yeah. with anyway, but with a motion and a second on the amendment, we need to take public comment on the amendment, but they, if they don't understand what the zoning is, then how can the public comment on it? I guess that's my question. I think that's a rhetorical question there. Yes, I, don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Or they could ask questions. Or they could ask questions. Right. All right. Well, let's open it up for public comment, okay? Now everybody gets, everybody gets, now we're talking about the amendment. Let's stay on track with that. Now what you get is one turn at the microphone unless an alderman brings you back up to ask you questions. And uh, keep your comments to me. Don't get engaged with anybody else up here but me, okay? All right. Good evening, Mayor Jordan. My name is Fanny Long and I will be speaking for the members of Eatonbrook sub Subdivision on the corner of Township and Crossover. Thank you for hearing our thoughts about this issue. I'm not as eloquent a speaker as my husband, Jeff Long, but I'll try to give a good representation of our situation. The builder has changed his plan suddenly from a residential office zone to a neighborhood services zone. We object to either one of these proposals. Crossover is in the process of changing to a four lane main drive with a median that will only allow cutouts for subdivisions. There is no such plan for the proposed property. The problem here is that people cannot enter or exit via a left-hand turn. Our concerns about this are many. First of all, they are planning to put a U-turn at that intersection to allow the residents on the west side of crossover to be able to go north. The problem with this is that there is not going to be a speed limit change of 45 miles per hour. In addition, they do not plan to change the length of the light change. At this point, only a few cars can get through at a time. And when you add two more lanes and a strip of businesses or, or whatnot, all trying to make a U-turn or a left, you end up with a huge traffic jam. And many of those people will use the Edenbrook POA Road and Candlewood to make that U-turn and get to those businesses. To complicate everything, we have rush hour, people from Candlewood, Covington, and Edenbrook all trying to get to work through that intersection. 
on top of all the traffic for drop off and pick up on, on top of all, in top of all of that, the traffic for drop off and pick up for both Vandergriff and McNair schools goes through that intersection. These children live in these neighborhoods and walk to and from home safely at the current time. Parents drop off and pick up their children, as do buses, making it a complete log jam at the township crossover intersection, both in the morning and again in the afternoon. By increasing crossover to four lanes, traffic is going to increase. Adding businesses is going to put even more stress on that inter intersection because the businesses would be so close to that intersection. And worse, making it dangerous for the, the school children. This intersection is already very hazardous, many accidents, uh, and with four lane, it's, it's going to be even more dangerous. So um, if you're trying to get this quickly resolved, we ask you to please wait until the road is complete and observe the traffic after that. Thank you for your time and consideration on this matter. Thank you. I guess, just long, I guess the question I would have for you, are, are you familiar with the NS zoning that they're posing? Yes. And, okay. Yes. Just want to be sure it, that's It's clear. still more traffic, no matter what it is, and okay. it's very close to that intersection. Okay. I just wanted to okay. get that. Thank you. All right. Who else would like to speak tonight? Okay. I'll bring it back to the council. Yeah, I think we've already talked about the possibility of leaving it here, especially with now we can publicize this zoning change and people can actually get some time to look at it. So, okay, we need to table the amendment? Uh, you can if you want to. I, I would like to make one comment about conditional uses, though, and what the Supreme Court has recently ruled on that. Uh, they have ruled that that is not a zoning decision, uh, which is entitled to great deference when you make a zoning decision. Uh, if there is any reasonable basis for you to make a zoning decision, then your decision will be upheld, and it's extremely difficult. We've never lost a zoning appeal when someone has complained. On the other hand, the Supreme Court ruled that a conditional use was not a zoning decision, but an administrative decision. And that means the decision of the Planning Commission or the City Council on appeal is entitled to no weight whatsoever. It is a brand new trial decided by a jury sitting like they would be the planning commission or the city council just to decide that one case about whether the conditional use should be granted or not. They don't have any experience in previous conditional uses or, or the scheme that we've had in Fayetteville or anything else like that. So that is not as much protection as, it, as we used to think it did, it was. And in fact, I've, I've talked with planning about trying to remove many of the things that we have as conditional uses that are the things that were would be dangerous and place them in separate zoning categories so they we could really be more safe and we wouldn't think we were safe with putting them in a conditional use and then have a jury grant them so i just wanted to make sure you were aware of the status of the law now that that is not as good a protection as we used to think it was <clears throat> Okay, so on back to the amendment, can we just leave it set here or do we need to table it, Ken, I guess is my question. That's totally up to what the city council wants to so You can either table it or, or, or just, vote on it now, just whatever you want to well, do. Well, I'd like mm -hmm. to go ahead and vote on the amendment so that people can be clear about what we're going to uh, be Which one it is. I think that's And we can have some I mean, that's fine with research. Yeah. Just need to know what y'all want to do. No, that's a good yeah. point. Thank you. This way we, we know, people know which way. We're talking about. We're talking about. All right, we, we have an motion and a second to amend to NS, correct? Am I right? Neighborhood services? Mm -hmm. All right. Any other final comments on that? Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Teddy? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Shotmar? No. Adams? Yes. Long? Yes. The amendment passed. Okay. Thank you all very much. All right, let's move on to new business. Okay. Can I make one more comment? Um, yes. Some of the neighbors had contacted my father to try to sway my vote um, on this issue, and I just want to say that that's entirely inappropriate, and if you would like to talk to me about this issue, please contact me directly and not work through my family members. Thank you. Okay. Are we not going to be able to speak to the main vote on the reading? Be ready. Well, Ben, I had it for public comment. You can... No, you were talking on the amendment. 
Usually the applicant gets an opportunity to present. Very well. I apologize, ma'am, for any confusion. Go ahead. Well, you know, we've got a problem here because uh, these folks bought this land 4.66 acres several years ago, and they're seeking a better use for it, and they don't need that for themselves. They don't need 4.66 acres. And so they had it rezoned, and uh, they've had it on the market for more than two years, and they haven't had a, even a single offer on a lot. So they're seeking a better use of it, and they have done everything they know to make the, the neighbors happy. They asked to meet with the Runnels, and they were refused. They said, no, we won't meet with you about it. But, beg your pardon? Okay, no, okay. Speak to, speak, speak only. Yeah. Don't speak to him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stay with me. Anyway, I was told by Jerry that they had asked Dr. Runnels for a meeting, that they would discuss what was going to go there, and he refused to have a meeting with him. You can ask Jerry directly, but that's what I was told. Secondly, uh, we asked two weeks ago to be able to meet with the property owners association that was here, gave them our telephone numbers and said, please call us, we would love to meet with you and discuss what we want to do there. No phone call from them either. So we've got 4.66 acres that these folks have done everything they know how. They came to me and said, would you help us get through the city? It can be difficult. And I said, I'll be happy to work with you. I have no interest in developing that property in any way. So Jerry asked me if I would help, and I volunteered to help, but I, I don't know what else he could do to satisfy the neighbors. He put a limit on the height. He, he put a limit on the materials. Uh, they did everything they knew possible because they're going to live there themselves. And uh, for, for you guys to not give them the opportunity to do something different, they've already tried to market it as what it is now. And uh, I just think we, we need to, we have a problem. The neighbors won't talk about it, and he's done everything he knows how to protect them. Uh, there's a height reg regulation. There's, well, we, you know what the Bill of Assurances says. Your own ordinances say you, you can't have single use in an area. 2030 plan says that multiple uses in an area is what you're looking for. And then somebody somewhere back there said that we want residential on uh, crossover road at that point. How did they know what was going to be the future? Could you tell us right now what's going to be there 10 years from now? No, you can't. And, uh, I assure you that every one of the property owners that's here wants to do for their own selves what the best thing to do for their property is. And the best thing for this one, I think, is neighborhood services. You asked us to consider that, and we did. I said, well, they don't need the Bill of Assurances. No, they want the Bill of Assurances, so, and we did that. What else could he do? What else could they do? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rogers, would you like to address us? You're the applicant here for a moment. Okay, everybody, hang on just a minute. All right. Still need to have the public be able to speak to you. Right. Yes, please come up and introduce yourself to microphone. Hi, I'm Brian Reynolds. My property is immediately adjacent to the land in question. And the Joneses have never asked me to have a meeting about this. And I, uh, swear on the Bible that that's true. Oh, okay. We and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the other thing is the U-turn the situation. If you live in this area, it's going to take you another 15 minutes to get your kids to school when this happens. And I think the people in, in Candlewood, when they come to realize that, are not going to appreciate that 15-minute wait. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Yes, go ahead. Sorry to bother you again, Mr. Mr. Mayor, but um, I'm the POA president uh, of Edenbrook, Fanny Long again, and we were never uh, called or t spoken to ever. I just received a flyer 
the day I got home from vacation and came to the meeting with no knowledge of anything. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and the council members. Uh, I'm Jerry Jones. I, I think y'all know who I am, the property owner. I don't want to uh, get into a lot of uh, he said, she said, and everything, but uh, prior to this all taking place, uh, uh, Dr. Runnels was, uh, was out of town. As a matter of fact, I believe he was in Canada when I called him and, uh, one evening, and uh, he said he was out of, out of town, uh, out of the country uh, fishing. And I told him that when he returned, I wanted to, my wife and I would like to get with him and his wife and talk about what we had, my wife and I were proposing to do about this subdivision. And he, and he uh, prior to him returning, I left him a note in his mailbox and then didn't hear from him. And then on his return home, when I didn't hear from him, well, then I called him two or three days later and they uh, refused to meet with me and my wife and discuss uh, our proposal about uh, the, this proposed change. Um, I, you know, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't say I'm, I'm, I'm a little uh, taken aback a little bit about all this. Uh, I, I don't understand all of the to do about why that somebody would be so objective, uh, or I mean, so objecting to me trying to improve my own uh, property. I mean, it's, I, I remember when I was a, a young boy in 1960, I was raised in Russellville, and the city council voted to put in a four block area, in a historical area, to put a, a new brand new post office and a brand new newspaper office right across the street from each other in a four block area. That place still exists today. Those homes are in a, uh, I mean, they're in perfect condition. The post office is still there. The newspaper is thriving. It's in a mixed use area. I mean, it's thriving. I mean, if, if, if I were like coming in here to want to put in a, uh, you know, a row of duplexes and stuff, I, I mean, I, that's not what I have in mind. I don't, we don't want that. We want something that our neighbors can be proud of, but they come up here and they use excuses, in my opinion, like the traffic is going to be a big issue, children are going to be endangered, and you know, it just seems like there are a bunch of excuses. And uh, uh, you know, that's not the type of person we are. Uh, we want something that's very compatible, something that will, when the people uh, pull out of Hickory Creek, they will pull out over there and they'll say, "Hey, that looks great over there." Uh, we really feel like we've done just about everything we know how uh, to uh, make them happy, uh, try to uh, be more forthcoming and let them know by the Bill of Assurances that we don't want, uh, you know, uh, uh, unwanted businesses in there. Uh, it states it out in the Bill of Assurances. Um, I mean, I wish they could kind of put themselves in my position. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't object when Hickory Creek uh, subdivision went in. I didn't, oppo I didn't oppose Candlewood when it went in. I didn't oppose Mr. Brown's subdivision or being rezoned to RO. Times are changing. Fayetteville's changing. I think this is a perfect time for something different to go in on Crossover Road. And I think something that the public will like, not just the people from, from our area, you know, 77 people challenged, I mean, uh, signed that petition. I think you may have six or eight people here tonight. If they were all that, all that gung-ho about stopping the progress in, on, uh, on the east side of town, why aren't they all here? Um, again, I'm, I'm just wanting to, I'd be, you, I'd be just like you. If you had something, I'm not coming in your yard telling you how to change or you got to have a particular color of your house or something. Um, I understand how people have concerns about, you know, I, I understand people's concerns. 
only when it comes to something that could be very controversial. We don't, we don't want anything that will be controversial there. You know, we love Fayetteville. We think this is a perfect time for change, for Fayetteville to go forward a little bit on the east side of town. And there's not enough land there to make that much difference anyway. So I wish that when y'all do, we do decide to vote on this, please take that in consideration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council members. And, and we appreciate your consideration of this. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? Now, Ms. Long, you've been up twice. Anyone else? Come on up. My name is Lynn Lorimer, and I'm a, I own the property about a block uh, south of, of uh, Mr. Gillen's property. And uh, <clears throat> I would just like to say that I had uh, a discussion with him a few years ago when there was planning going on on Highway 265, which my house is on, his house is also on Highway 265 as well. I spent almost an hour on his front porch trying to explain to him that he and I both need to go down to the city hall, talk to the, the, uh, the council, and see if we can keep from having a median out there in front, of, in front of his house and my house as well. Well, in that discussion, I explained to him that I know that you have five of these lots here for sale and they're very, very expensive lots. They're estate lots. I said, if they put a, a median out there in front of your house, those lots there, that you're never going to be able to sell those as residential or any kind of lots because you can't turn left out of the, the lot or turn left into the lot. Well, thank God I was successful talking with uh, the state people and also with uh, uh, Mayor Jordan that in front of my house, I have a continuous turn lane. Thank God for that, because at least I can get in and out of my driveway along with all the other of the neighbors of mine and also the subdivisions across the street, they can enter and exit to the left. However, he did not come down here and talk to anybody. He was convinced that everything was all right. There was no problem with having a median out in front of his house. Uh, he wasn't very convincing to me, but I want to tell you right now that I am so glad that I do not have a median in front of my house. Now, in retrospect, I can see why, why he has asked for a rezoning now. For one reason is to have commercial property there is going to be more valuable to him. He can't possibly sell it as residential. I'm not sure that he'd be able to sell it even if it was commercial but I don't want to take that chance. I don't know what he's going to put in there. All he's doing is telling us a few things that he won't do. I don't know what his plans are. He hasn't showed me any kind of a drawing or even, even a piece of paper saying he wants to put a barber shop in there. It might be all right if we could get some kind of indication exactly what his intentions are. But right now he has his house and five lots. They're all up for sale very expensive, and I, sh I, I know that he wants to get as much out of it as he possibly can, but in this case here, I think that we have a lot of neighbors there with a lot of very high-end priced houses, some of them way above a million dollars. Now, I can understand putting a barbershop in front of, you know, in, in the, the middle of a neighborhood that might have fifty or hundred thousand dollar houses, but not those that are eight hundred, nine hundred. You you may not have any sympathy with me, but stay with me. I am a a landowner there that I bought that land specifically because I knew that whole thing there was all residential. Including his land. If I'd have known there was going to be businesses there, I probably would have bought somewhere else. Out on Skillin Road. But I didn't. 
So with that in mind, I just want you to keep in mind that you have a lot of very, very nice people there that in, in the event that we have businesses go in there, in that 4.66 acres, there's probably going to be a lot of people move out. And when they start moving out, what happens to land prices? The property prices will certainly go down. And none of us, and you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people that are involved here, compared to one person. Who do you want to satisfy? You want to satisfy the city, or you want to satisfy one landowner? Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Does the council wish to hear from anybody else? No. Okay. All right. So it is uh, an NS amendment or a uh, zoning we'll be looking at in two weeks, correct? Yes. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Garner. Uh, I didn't see anything in the packet with a request from the applicant to change the zoning. Uh, can we get a formal request in writing from you with also your statement that your previous bill of assurance still applies to your current zoning request? I have a copy of my email that I sent to Mr. Garner or one of the guys over there. I did send a... Okay. Could, I, could I get a, a letter from your owner probably too and give it to Mr. Garner that would be signed saying that this is his request now and that the bill of assurance still applies to this request? Sure. Okay, thank Happy you. Just to. give it to the planning department if you would. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Everybody good? All right. So that we're clear, this is left on the second reading yes. at Neighborhood Services yes. to be heard on September yes. the 3rd. Yes. Right. Okay, everybody, everybody good? All right. Or whether you're good or not, I don't know, but that's when it'll be heard again. <laughs> All right. All right. Moving on to new business. Number one, John Best Claim Settlement, a resolution pursuant to Federal Code of Ordinance at subsection 39.10, authorizes the mayor to pay $11,000 to John Best in settlement of a damage claim arising at 830 East Trust Street and approving budget adjustment. Tim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Tim Nyder, Water and Sewer Operations Manager. This resolution uh, relates to an incident that happened at 3 a.m. on October the 21st of 2012 where an eight-inch water main up on Vincent Avenue ruptured, causing a significant volume of water to flow downhill around the residence of Trust Street. Because it occurred in the middle of the night, it took several hours for the crews to find the leak and, and to isolate it. Um, in that uh, large volume of water, the house at 830 Trust received significant damage to its dry stack wall. Um, Ordinance 5504 identifies the, the claim process and, and Mr. Best fully complied with the process and submitted three quotes to the city on his claim. Um, his original claim was for $18,500 and this damage was not covered by his insurance. Uh, through work performed by the city crews and evaluation of the damage, uh, city staff and Mayor Jordan have worked out with Mr. Best to develop a settlement of $11,000 for full resolution and closure of this claim. Um, Mr. Best agrees to this settlement provided is approved by the city council. Uh, the budget adjustment moves funds into the water mains maintenance self-insurance account. Uh, administration recommends approving this claim settlement. Questions from council? Mark. This came before the Water, Sewer, Solid Waste Committee, and we uh, reviewed the options that were presented on both sides of the argument, as well as the compromise, and we unanimously agreed that this was a fair settlement. Okay. Any other questions, Coach? Al? I don't have a question. I was going to make a motion to pass the resolution. Second. Let me take some public comments. Any public comment on this? Okay. Bring it back to the council. We have a motion and a second to pass the resolution. Sandra, would you please call the roll? Barsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Shotbar? Yes. Adams? Yes. Long? Yes. All right. Thank you, Council. All right. Number two, vacation 13 4428, 4291 Black Canyon Street, Hamptons Lot 18. 
An ordinance approving vacation 13-4428 submitted by Engineering Services Incorporated for property located at 4291 Black Canyon Street to vacate a portion of a pedestrian access easement, a total of 0 0.03 acres. Kip. Whereas the City Council has authority under ACA 1454-104 to vacate public grounds or portions thereof which are not required for corporate purposes, and whereas the City Council has <coughs> determined that the following described portion of a platted access easement is not required for corporate purposes. Now, therefore, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas, Section 1, that the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas, hereby vacates and abandons the following described access easement as shown in Exhibit B attached. Section 2, that a copy of this ordinance duly certified by the City Clerk, along with a map attached and labeled Exhibit A, shall be filed in the <coughs> Office of the of the County and recorded in the deed records of the County, and Section 3, that this vacation approval is subject to the condition of approval and shall not be in effect until the condition is met, a 10-foot public access easement shall be dedicated on lot 17 prior to the subject vacation becoming valid. Andrew? <coughs> if this property is located in the Hampton subdivision, I have it pulled up here in the aerial photo. It's just east of the Stonebridge Meadows Golf Course. Um, there was a requirement when this mm -hmm. final plat went through for this neighborhood there's a pedestrian access easement platted to the park here, Rodney Ryan Park. And I'll pull up um, this blow up photo here. You can see uh, here's the park, here's the subject property. You can see the orange line going through. There's a pedestrian access easement to connect the neighborhood into the park. Uh, this property owner requests to vacate this easement and dedicate additional easement on the lot right next to them. Uh, the lot next to them is basically an unbuildable lot. There's a really large gas easement going through there. So the property owners have agreed to do that and the Planning Commission and staff recommend this be approved. Thanks. Okay, what questions do we have for Andrew on this? Anything? Okie dokie. Any public comment on this? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. Who we suspend the rules and go to the second reading? Second. We have a motion and a second to go to the second reading. Sunder, would you please call the roll? Marsh? Yes. Hingen? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Shotmark? Yes. Adam? Yes. Long? Yes. An ordinance approving BAC 13-4428 submitted by Engineering Services Incorporated for property located at 4291 Black Canyon Street to vacate a portion of a pedestrian access easement a total of three hundredths of an acre. Move to spin the rules and go to the third and final reading. Second. We have a motion and a second to go to the third and final reading. Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tenet? Yes. Shotmark? Yes. Adams? Yes. Long? Yes. An ordinance approving BAC 13-4428 submitted by Engineering Services Incorporated for property located at 4291 Black Canyon Street to vacate a portion of a pedestrian <coughs> access easement a total of three hundredths of an acre. Okay. Any final comments from the council on this? Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tenet? Yes. Shotmark? Yes. Adam? Yes. Long? Yes. Okay, number three, Marshall GIS. An ordinance waiving the requirements of formal competitive bidding and approving a contract with Marshall GIS in the total amount of $26,975 to purchase five software seeds of GeoConnects mobile implementation software for usage by the Water and Sewer Division and approving a project contingency of $4,000. Kit. Whereas GeoConnects mobile implementation software from Marshall GIS provides the ability to enter work order data from the field in real time while linking the work order with the asset on which the crew is working on a digital map. And whereas the software acts as a mobile link between the city's Hanson software and its ArcGIS mapping system allowing field crews to take photos linked to the GPS coordinates at a job site without the ent entries having to be separately saved into another computer. And whereas the GeoConnect software op offered through Marshall GIS is the only software the city has found through extensive research which has proven itself to successfully and reliably integrate the Hanson and ArcGIS software in a mobile environment. Now, therefore, it be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas, Section 1, that the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas, hereby determines an exceptional situation exists in which competitive bidding is deemed not feasible or practical, and therefore weighs the requirements of formal competitive bidding and approves a contract with Marshall GIS 
in the total amount of $26,975 to purchase five software seats of GeoConnect's mobile implementation software for usage by the Water and Sewer Division and further approves a $4,000 project contingency. Tim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think Mr. Williams said it all there. Um, <clears throat> basically, what we want to do, the, the water and sewer guys, we go out there and we, we fix our assets and then we fill out work orders, put them in through the Hanson software. All our assets that we work on are uh, physically located in the city's mapping system. Well, these two softwares, they don't interact with each other. What this new system will do will, will give us a, a lot of options for the future where our field crews can go out and they can, they can GPS the assets, they can look at it. If they're a little bit misplaced or we've got the wrong size of pipe there, we can change it, send it back for approval and, and we'll get it changed in, in our mapping system. Uh, what we ideally someday would like to do is if we get called out on a leak, we can look it up on the system. It'll tell the, the crew leader what valves he needs to shut off immediately to stop the water flow, keep the excess water from flowing. It's all something looking for the future, and, and it's a great uh, tool that we can use. It will, it will make our division more efficient. Tonight, I do have Greg Mitchell with GIS coordinator here to ask, answer any of the technical questions you might have. Any questions from anybody? Pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. I move we accept this as published. And this did go before the Water Sewer Solid Waste Division. It was a concern because there wasn't a competitive bid, but uh, realizing the unique situation that we had in front of us for the uh, uh, for this system to interact with our GIS system, we approved it unanimously to be brought to City Council. I second that. Okay, okay, what we have is, it's an ordinance. Let me take some public comment and then we'll go into it. Uh, any public comment on this? Okay, seeing none, bring it back to the council. I understand that's a motion to second go to the second reading. Yes. Okay. Do we have a motion to go to the second reading? Mm -hmm. oh, so moved. moved. Yeah, second. Motion to second go to the second reading. Sonny, would you please call the roll? Carr? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tenet? Yes. Shotmar? Yes. Adams? Yes. Long? Yes. An ordinance waiving the requirements of formal competitive bidding and approving a contract with Marshall GIS in the total amount of $26,975 to purchase five software seats of GeoConnect's mobile implementation software for usage by the Water and Sewer Division and approving a budget adjustment of $4,000. Motion to suspend the rules and go to third and final reading. Second. We have a motion to second to go to the third and final reading. Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh. Yes. Kenyon. Yes. Petty. Yes. Tennant. Yes. Shotmar. Yes. Adams. Yes. Long. Yes. An ordinance waiving the requirements of formal competitive bidding and approving a contract with Marshall GIS in the total amount of $26,975 to purchase five software seats of GeoConnect's mobile implementation software for usage by the Water and Sewer Division and approving a project contingency of $4,000. Any final comments from the council? Yes, I want to thank the, uh, the staff for, for doing their extensive research to make sure that this was truly the only uh, provider of this. I think that's important for the people to know. And also, um, this is just another example of how technology can uh, help the productivity, efficiency, and management of our city. and. We need to do this as much as we can. Uh, I think this is a great idea, and I appreciate the, uh, the long-term effects of this. Okay. Any other comments? All right. Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Shotmar? Yes. Adams? Yes. Long? Yes. Okay. Number four, 2014 Employee Benefits Package. Resolution approving a 2014 Employee Benefits Package. Missy, I believe you're... Hi, I'm Missy Leffler, the city's HR director. The city offers, as you know, uh, various insurance packages for its employees. We have three contracts, uh, two for renewal and one that would be a new contract that's presented for council approval this evening. The first two would be renewals of the city's life insurance contract for employees, city pay life, and city pay long-term disability for employees. We would propose that council renew with the same company we've been doing business with, the Standard. They've been providing excellent uh, customer service 
excellent product. Um, we have nothing but very, very good things to say about them, and they were selected through competitive bidding process originally and have far exceeded our expectations, certainly much better than their predecessor company. Um, we asked for counsel to renew that. I presented the details at the agenda session, but would be happy to take any questions on that before we move on to health insurance. Okay. Oh. Oh, we're talking life insurance right now, are we? Okay. Yes, sir. No, I don't have a question about life insurance. Okay. Any questions on the life? On the life or the disability? Thank you very much. I'll move on to the health insurance then. Uh, as you know, we had quite a lengthy presentation at the agenda session, so I'll try to hit the high points, uh, but if I leave something out that you have a question about, please feel free to ask me or the city's benefits broker. Jacob Salinas is here. He can come up and take your questions, as well as Pachitao, uh, Pachili, excuse me, new married name, uh, the, the city's benefits administrator. Uh, the city uh, has had a price increase in health insurance premiums like many employers. Our prices have moved into more typical price ranges that employers see. Uh, as you know, we've done studies comparing ourselves to other employers, municipalities. Uh, we've looked at surveys of private Northwest Arkansas employers. We've looked at many, many surveys. And basically, our prices are moving into normal price range for 2014. Uh, and at, in response to that, the city's going to move into more normal employer contributions, which is to say increased prices and reduced employer contribution to a more typical level you see of other municipalities and other employers. And I guess I left out a very important part that we covered at Agenda, and that's that after an intense competitive bidding process, Blue Cross Blue Shield was selected for the city's insurance for next year. Uh, it is more, it was a better price and uh, some improvements th that will benefit the employees in the high deductible product as well. Uh, the city has two goals that I think it tries to keep in balance. We want to take care of our employees and offer a competitive benefits package because that helps reduce turnover. We, have a, we, we benefit from our low turnover and have many employers who've been here 10, 20, 30 years. And I think that helps our efficiency. But at the same time, you, of course, as council, have a fiscal responsibility to the taxpayers. Hence the move to a uh, reduced percentage of employer contributions in many instances in response to the increase in price. But I think this proposal uh, that the administration proposes is, is a, a good balance achieved through difficult considerations that went on for weeks and weeks. And I think one of the things that the city does right, that it will continue to do right for its employees is that unlike many employers that offer simply a PPO or traditional health insurance, the city has a second option, a high deductible option. And when we looked at the surveys, we were surprised that that's apparently uncommon. And what that means is the city is offering a less expensive option for if an employee might not feel they're in a position to afford the regular insurance, they've still got a place to go that the city's contributing generously to because it's less expensive. So an employee can avoid a catastrophic incident if, God forbid, they get in a car wreck. They've got that protection that will limit their financial losses with the high deductible insurance. Uh, you've seen the charts, you've seen the prices. I, I don't want to bore you with details you've already got in front of you, but I'm happy to take questions. Uh, the overall impact is this. The total price increase counting city contributions and employee contributions for next year would be $1.6 million more, of which the proposal is that the city shoulder approximately $500,000 additionally more of the burden and the employees will shoulder the other 1.1 million with their collective contributions. Uh, now that 500,000, as we state in the packet, assumes enrollment consistent with our current enrollment but you can't predict that with a crystal ball, but we had to have something. And by that, I mean this many with individual coverage, this many with family coverage. You know, we had to have something to use for an estimate, but the estimate would be approximately 500,000 additional dollars. I'll be happy to take any questions. What questions, what questions do we have for Missy on this? Mr. Mayor? Yes, Al. Um, 
I see one of our local pharmacists in the room, so it, it um, made me want to ask a question. Will this affect in any way the um, city employees' prescription drug benefits? No, I'm happy to say that the coverage for the coverages should all be the same as far as medical items that are covered and as far as pharmacy items that are covered, generally speaking. Now I've got my generally speaking and I'm gonna explain with regard to, um, let me take it one at a time. There was, with regard to medical claims, there was never any request by the city to let's cover fewer medical things. Uh, so to the best of our knowledge, the same will be covered, but having done this for a few years i have seen before when an employer switches insurance companies sometimes there'll be uh, an item here or there that there is a change into the extent to which it's covered that was not anticipated so that's why i say generally but the city did not say let's let's quit covering surgeries or let's quit covering this or that on medical claims we asked for the same comparable coverage now with regard to drugs we did not ask for anything to be different. It's the same copays on the PPO plan. A person has a $10 or $30 or $50 copay when they go to the pharmacy. $10 for generic, you know, 30 or 50. Uh, on the high deductible plan, the employee pays for all of it until they hit their deductible and then the plan picks up next year 100%. Currently it picks up 80%, so that's an improvement. Now here's as we tell employees on the video we put on Access Fayetteville where there can be a difference. Um, each, or each drug, each insurance company negotiates with each drug company. Okay, so uh, if you have insurance through one health insurance company, your particular antibiotic might cost you one thing because that's how they negotiated with that drug company. You ha I have insurance with another insurance company. I may pay a different amount for that same exact drug because that's how my insurance company negotiated with that drug company. So when I say generally it's the same drug coverage, there can be differences depending on if Blue Cross negotiated differently with a drug company on a drug than United Healthcare, the current carrier, did. And we did experience that when we initially switched from Blue Cross to United Healthcare. Some people's prescriptions got more expensive, some became less expensive depending on that difference in negotiations. And I imagine the same thing could happen again in reverse. Okay. I kind of have a, a follow-up question to that. Are, are we making sure that our local pharmacies are included in the plan um, so that it's just not all national chain accounts so that we're reinvesting in our own economy through our insurance plan? Well, we had Blue Cross at the city for the better part of 50 years with an exception in 06 when the city went with Cigna and the last two years this year and previous year when we went with uh, United Healthcare. And this is anecdotal, but my experience was that Blue Cross had a very extensive network with medical providers and pharmacy, very robust in Northwest Arkansas. And I'm gonna admit to you, I didn't do homework on that and see if it had deteriorated the last two years I presumed it had not. Uh, our benefits broker could speak to that better than, than I could. Uh, is she? Would you like me to get him up here? Please. Jacob. I'd like to introduce Jacob Salinas. He's with Gallagher Benefit Services. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Jordan, council members. Uh, my name is Jacob Salinas with Gallagher Benefit Services. We are your representative in the benefit package um, program. Um, our review of the proposals provided to us by United Healthcare, Blue Cross Blue Shield, we don't see any significant changes in network. Um, as a matter of fact, to Missy's point, sometimes we'll see um, changes in benefit because of policy, the way benefits are uh, configured. But uh, in terms of the network, we don't see any drastic changes. We did find out that uh, there are some providers, such as the VA, that's not contracted Blue Cross Blue Shield, but other than that, we're not aware of any other significant changes. There's so many pharmacies that are in the network, it'd be hard to do a one-by-one -one review of, of each one. Well, my, my question was more oriented toward, are we just covering national chain pharmacies like the Walgreens? Yeah, the, the, there's a mix the of both independent and, and national. are including local pharmacies yeah. in that too? Yeah, there's independent and nationals okay. in, in the pharmacy network. To, to answer your that question. That was my question. Okay. 
Yes, sir. Um, what about uh, changing doctors? Is this going to require anyone to change doctors? We encourage our employees to make sure to ask their doctors, and just as when we switched from Blue Cross to United Healthcare, we gave them their benefits packets in September, and we advised them make sure your medical provider is in network so you don't have any surprises. If they aren't, invite them to join the network, the network being a contract between them and, uh, and United Healthcare or Blue Cross. And what we did do, city staff in HR at the Chief of Staff's encouragement when we switched before, we called some of the local major clinics and gave their uh, billing and insurance departments a heads up. The city is changing. At that time, it was to United Healthcare. And we managed to call a couple of them who said, oh, well, we'll join then if your employees are going to be in it. And I imagine we'll do the same thing this time as well, call the major hospitals, major clinics. Um, but my memory, if memory serves correctly, unless things have changed drastically, the major clinics and hospitals locally are already in Blue Cross. But we do ask employees to make sure so that if they do need to make a choice about changing, they've got plenty of time to do so. But Blue Cross has a very, very robust network in Northwest Arkansas. I might add that when we switched two years ago, um, Sherry Langenham, who was the, uh, in HR at the time, and I did in a very extensive one-on-one -on -one review from where our largest spins had been with uh, both medical facilities and pharmacy facilities within our current plans at the time to see if we had any major um, provider gaps moving to UHC. Our experience at that time was that there were, there were some instances, um, but they were always on the side of UHC that we needed to qualify, not Blue Cross Blue Shield qualifying. So we actually expect that um, some of the items that individuals who might not have dealt with United Healthcare will be back in network. I do want to remind the council though that we cannot make a provider or a pharmacy um, agree to the terms and conditions of the various insurance <coughs> companies and those are negotiated contracts and to establish their networks. Um, we always connect those who are not to the providers and encourage their um, enrollment. But in this, um, I just did a curse review this time and it appears that um, our major spends are all included within the, net, the network we'll be moving to. And, and just so you know, we uh, both insurance companies have a website where people can type in their doctor's names, their clinic's names, and find out if they're in network. The medical expense to an employee typically falls around um, maintenance-related drugs where prescriptions have to be rewritten from one company to the other. Uh, that's usually the only significant change that we see. It's not provider related. Any, any other questions? Okay. What public comment do we have on this? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. Just bring the rules to a second reading. Well, this is a resolution. Oh, it's a resolution. Yes. Okay. I'll make a motion. We pass. Second. We have a motion and second to pass the resolution. Um, I certainly want to thank uh, Missy and Chi and Don and Paul's work on this because it was a long procedure. It took us several weeks to take us this far. And at the end of the day, this is a call that. Uh, that I make and uh, was not necessarily an easy call, but it was a call that had to be made. So um, I want to thank those folks for their work. Yes, Al. You know, I, I also wanted to say thank you to the, to the mayor and to the staff on this because when I asked a question at agenda session about the open enrollment period, it wasn't just for my information. It was so that the city employees could look at their checks when they got them. I wanted to make sure they had time to get their pay stub to make sure that they could afford, you know, this change and it, to see what they needed to do. And the city went above and beyond, not just 15 
days, which is normal, or 14 days, but it extended it to 60 days. And I just think that that's extraordinary um, to work for a place that will do that for you. So just thank you, the administration. Any other comments? Uh, Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh? Yes. Kidden? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Schumer? Yes. Adams? Yes. Slough? Yes. <clears throat> okay. The last item of business we have tonight is a Get Lit LLC, License of the Ozarks. An ordinance waiving the requirements of formal competitive bidding and approving an agreement with Get Lit LLC in the amount of $51,462 for the purchase of lights for the expansion of Lights of the Ozarks to Block Street and Dixon Street and approving a budget adjustment in the amount of $46,500. Yeah. Mayor, uh, whereas the Fayetteville Advertising and Promotion Commission has obtained $10,000 for the expansion of Lights of the Ozark to Block Street and Dixon Street, and whereas additional funding for this project is possible through GIF legislative funds, and whereas Get Lit LLC is the contractor being used by the AMP Commission, for the purchase of additional lights, and whereas Get Lit LLC is the only provider for Razorback themed lighting to be placed on Dixon Street, and whereas time to complete competitive bidding is not possible due to the necessity to proceed with this project in time for the 2013 Lights of the Ozark display. Now therefore it be ordained by the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas, Section 1, that the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas hereby deems an exceptional situation exists in which competitive bidding is deemed not feasible or practical, and therefore weighs requirements of formal competitive bidding and approves an agreement with Get Lit LLC in the amount of $51,462 for the purchase of lights for the expansion of Lights of the Ozarks to Block Street and Dixon Street. Section 2, that a copy that the City Council of the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas hereby approves the budget adjustment a copy of which is attached to this ordinance as Exhibit A. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, Mayor Jordan uh, met with the staff um, after visiting with, uh, I believe, uh, business owners in the two areas that we're looking to expand. This is the 15th anniversary of Lights of the Ozarks. Um, it was the intention of the mayor to look for a way to extend this beyond just a drive around the square. It would take people through our uh, downtown entertainment and downtown business districts. Um, at the time we began working on this, we were trying to seek funding uh, from areas beyond the city's uh, reserve funds. However, the request for general improvement funds uh, by Representative Whitaker, who has agreed to take that request forward, that meeting is not until September, and the opportunity for the city to have these lights ordered and the lead time to be received so they can be placed up um, is prior to that date. It's actually Friday of this week. Um, the mayor asked city staff uh, to evaluate uh, options to provide lighting. Um, Terry Gully with our transportation division who currently assists us with uh, putting the banners on Dixon Street uh, and Connie Edmonston with Parks and Rec who does the lighting for the square um, through their divisions. We uh, began working with Dee Dee Peters and our communications department to look for lighting options. Um, it's not as easy as one might think because it requires electricity where every place that you need to connect this. Um, it requires light poles that can bear the wind load of fixtures attached to it, um, of which some streets we have that capability, other streets we do not. So what's presented in front of you tonight are uh, lighted garlands for Block Street to be wrapped in the um, all of the street lights to extend it down Block Street. Um, the electrical for that, the street was pre-run um, for it, but to have that uh, done. And those, that street to be um, handled by our park staff who is stringing lights on the square. On the transportation uh, division, we are recommending the purchase of 72 street lamp uh, attached lights, which extend over the street and sidewalk. 
Um, we were trying to look for opportunities so that we weren't making an investment just for a six or seven week period. Um, and so the design that the staff came up with was um, a red and white theme, um, poinsettias, snowflakes, and lighted razorbacks. So that could be extended for football season or basketball season uh, to get us more than just that time period. That total cost is outlined in your packet, um, $56,500. $10,000 of funding reduces that fee that was provided by the Advertised and Promotion Commission for an expansion of Lights of the Ozarks due to its 15th year anniversary. Um, and the remaining $46,500 is being sought from the city to place the order and the general improvement funds request um, is being made for the entire cost, um, which is a little over 73,000. Uh, we have no guarantee of that funding, so we wanna make that clear, um, but we do apply and we do have support from our state legislative contact. Um, the mayor believes that expanding these lights uh, in these streets is a positive economic development impact for our downtown entertainment business districts and also to help promote um, additional quality of life items, events for people to attend during the holiday season. All right, what questions do we have for Chief Staff? Okay. I have a question. Yes. All right. Um, I'd like to hear some discussion over the Razorback themed lighting. Just what, what was the idea behind that? Kind of where it, it was from. red and it could be extended could beyond be extended. Christmas. The thought process was that they could be maintained at key intersections. There's 72 light poles. Um, you know, we could get up, up here. Our, our, we really were hesitant on whether we even throw ideas on the table because then we get into a design of, of many and I'm sure everyone would like to have something. Some won't want a poinsettia. Some might not like a snowflake. Uh, some might not want to raise her back, but the thinking of the staff was last year, if you'll remember, uh, we all were inundated with calls that the flags on the poles were not taken down immediately yes. in January. And why did we have Christmas themes taking place in January and February? So we were trying to select <coughs> items that might give the staff a little more flexibility in terms of getting those items down. Um, snowflakes can extend into January. Razorbacks can extend into basketball season. And uh, poinsettias weren't necessarily um, just related to a Christmas season. But snowflakes and uh, poinsettias were also a part of a holiday theme. We didn't want to go with uh, certain symbols like Christmas trees because we wanted to be sensitive to the diversity of our community um, with other religions such as the Jewish faith. Um, so we tried to select something that might be more neutral and acceptable to the community. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, I too have concerns about the Razorback theme. You know, I, I feel like we have enough red and white Razorback stuff going on in this town and that's the mascot for our university and the city is a separate entity. And, uh, you know, maybe if we went with purple, uh, like our school or um, green because we try to be a green community. Um, so I, I really could support this um, or feel better about supporting it if we were to um, amend it to remove the Razorback theme from the resolution or the ordinance. So I, I make a motion that we remove the Razorback themed uh, language from the resolution. I'll second that. Okay, well, let's discuss the amendment then. Go ahead. I believe that the uh, Razorback is relevant because this is the gateway into the university from College Avenue. And so if there's a national championship, if there's something we need uh, to celebrate along with a very large number of people that live in the city uh, that are associated with the university, either as a student or as a uh, alumni, which I am, and uh, or on staff, and that they and and we recognize that <clears throat> there's one thing in the city that 
is certainly unique about the city of Fayetteville, and that is the heritage of the university here in Fayetteville. And so I recognize this as uh, important as a partnership, as a gateway into the university, and also, uh, again, allowing this to be utilized not just for a holiday theme. So that's why I think it is relevant to have the uh, Razorback along with this because some people don't maybe celebrate a winter holiday so much as they might want to celebrate their affection for a very part, a very big part of the heritage that we have here in the city of Fayetteville. And that would be the University of Arkansas and it could be represented by the Razorback. I would agree with Alderman Kenyon. I think sometimes you can be hypersensitive to, um, but we don't want to offend people. So, so let's be really careful. And I understand that. But I also think the bigger picture of the Razorback thing here is 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 the other things that can can it be used for, as well as I think you can grow this thing, and I think this will grow tremendously over the years. I bet in ten years those avenues are much more lit up and i invite fayetteville high school to bring purple things down and i and, and bring their ideas bring bring more ideas but let's start with this let's get this going and uh, and see where it takes us and gives us opportunities in advertising promotions we've got all sorts of ideas of how to benefit from this not just during the holiday time so i i understand the idea that that some people might not like it um but i think we can we can add to it later, we can change things, we can do things, but, but we've got to get started and it sounds like we're a little time sensitive. So I think we go ahead and move forward with what we've got and, uh, and go from there. Second that. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, you know, I really couldn't care less what the stuff is. I just want to see it done. <laughs> um, we got the Block Street Bazaar, which could benefit from this. And of course, Dixon Street would also benefit from having the traffic flow between the square and Dixon. Um, you know, I just point out the school district is also technically a separate entity, but separateness is totally abstract. We all grew up with this stuff here in the community. You know, U of A almost made it to Farmington, but Fayetteville won out at the last minute. Fayetteville wouldn't be here if not for that decision. And then about 40 years after it had been here, Little Rock and Searcy finally realized what they had allowed to happen and tried to move it back down to central Arkansas. And thank goodness that didn't happen. Um, so I, I'm not the biggest sports fan, but uh, I'd really just like to see the lights up there and some lights going across the street. And, you know, if, there's, if somebody wants to put a maypole up, you know, by all means, let's just get people out there on the road. I think the original college building may still be up in Cane Hill. Um, where, where I think the original college could have gone. And I, I would like to think what, what, what Fayetteville would be like had the uh, University of Arkansas sat in Cane Hill. My guess is uh, we probably wouldn't be sitting here uh, or we'd all be sitting in Cane Hill. So anyway, thank you for that. Any other comments on the amendment? What public comments do we have on the amendment? Yes. <laughs> Catherine Owen, Fayetteville. I too am an alumnus of this university and I love it. But I have a couple of questions. Before I'm having I a little difficulty oh, here. I'm a little there shorter than some people. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions before I make my comment. Uh, my first question is, is Get Lit LLC a local company? I believe they're located in Springdale, Arkansas. There is, is, that, a is that for sure they're in Springdale? So they are sort of local? <laughs> They're not a Fayetteville-based company. Um, I, I don't believe so, but the city cannot discriminate on the location. I just asked. I just wondered if you knew where they were based. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, my second question is, um, how much is the University of Arkansas putting into this project? They're not putting anything in. Okay. $51,462 to look pretty, to bring people to Block Street when they already come to Block Street. I think that this money should be used for something else, or at least part of it. I think it's too much money. When I have been driving around this town for two weeks and nothing has been done 
to clear any of the brush around any of the intersections. I live by the university, and let me tell you, it's a dangerous world these days. Next week, it's going to be even more dangerous because for some reason, the city has not cleared any of the intersections before the students started coming back. And I asked somebody why, and they said something about a budget, something about we don't have enough people. And then I come to this meeting tonight, and I see that you can spend $51,462 on lights, but you can't spend enough money to make the intersections around the university and around Fayetteville safe. Can somebody answer this question, why? I'm addressing you, Mayor Okay. Jordan. Uh, we view this as an economic driver for the city. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm very We believe here. that this is an economic driver for this city. Now, the lights of the Ozark brings in hundreds of thousands of people every year, and mm -hmm. they shop and they spend their money here. Now, as far as the intersections go, I know that we do what we can. Yeah, Mayor, I yeah. might What do you mean by what you can? I'm sorry. Mayor, I might add that the city has a... Uh, citizen requests process for the um, anything of this nature if someone needs to clear and Terry Gully with transportation is mm -hmm. here we do have a three mm -hmm. person crew that uh, does these requests we have been doing a uh, cleaning of right of ways for really the last six week uh, time period <laughs> so if there's an area that needs to be identified if uh, citizens see that they can submit it to the city and we'll put it yeah, to the if list you do, if you will fill out your request i called the city last week and told them about the stop sign right next to my house and how the vines have so grown over it that you can't even see it it's a very dangerous intersection two blocks from campus i drove around my neighborhood all this past couple of weeks since orientation and since all these students are coming back and every single almost every intersection there's brush there's nobody out cutting they haven't been cutting in my neighborhood. I went down 71 Highway, and there's all these little trees that look beautiful instead of sidewalks, and they're blocking all the, um, the view. I saw somebody almost get hit because there's these nice little trees. They look you beautiful. You mean the trees that we have along? The one you have the along 71 Highway oh. instead of a sidewalk. Okay. They look beautiful until they're starting to grow because of all okay. our rain. I saw three almost accidents. I stopped a man and said, wait, let me see if I can help you. I've had to get out into the middle of intersections all over this town for weeks because you can't see. Now, $51,462, that's a lot of money to me. I don't know how much you folks make a year, but that's more than I make a year. I question why you have to rush this through. You think you need to have these lights because of the Razorbacks, or because there's other companies that do lights. They are, trust me, there's other companies that put up lights. I think that you should not pass this tonight. I think it ought to be put on a second reading. Okay. That's my opinion. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you. Who else would like to address this tonight? We're talking about the amendment now. Uh, Joe Fennell with the Dixon Street Merchants Association. Uh, we're, we wholeheartedly support this idea. We, we see the value in, uh, in the economic development. We see the beauty that it does add to the, the city. Um, I actually get out in front of my business most every day and s sweep it up, and I don't wait for the city to come do that for me. Um, and so I know the city has things that are, cause problems for them, but that doesn't cause a problem for me, but Dixon Street Merch Association has been something that hasn't been around for a bit, but we're back now. I'm, I'm the president here. Um, I've spoken with the mayor and a lot of other people in town uh, about this idea, and everybody I've spoken to is very, very excited about it. Uh, the thing that we would like to request would, would if the city would uh, work with the, the, what is it, the uh, the the lighting people to see if we've had other we've had individual business down there request to do uh, holiday lighting on their own what we would like to do is try and keep in the same theme of what you all are <clears throat> are um, talking about here so if we could have the opportunity to purchase lights at maybe the same price as the city's getting them so we could individually decorate our businesses or whatever so we could 
help be good stewards to the city and help you all along with this cause, we would we would wholeheartedly uh, um, enjoy that. Um, you know, one thing that's, uh, you know, I've been on Dixon Street since 1980. And one thing that's always been evident to me that is that Dixon Street is, is a jewel of our city. And uh, at times it shines brighter than others. And I think at, at, at this juncture, with your support, this would help Dixon Street shine brighter in the future. And like I said, we, we support uh, we support this, and we we are energetically engaged in making this thing a, a success for the city and for all the people that that come to our city. Thank Joe, you. do you have an opinion on the hog? This is the, on the. Hey, I'm. You, you know, we talked about it, and you know, once one of the things that we talked about is uh, um, is you know we saw white that went to red and you know, because as you get closer to the university it is the university and 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 it is red and and i understand what sarah's saying about the purple dogs and you know all my kids went to Fayetteville high school and i do agree that you know let's let's get the purple dogs involved yep. and get them get get the purple down there and, and that can all be part of this whole thing and, as justin was saying you know let's just let's get this thing off its feet and then it, it'll drive itself wherever it's going to go. I, you know, I trust the, the the people in this city that help make the decisions. Um, that the, it'll all be good. So uh, I'm I'm fine with it. Let's just get her done. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Anybody else? Carl. Oh, go ahead, Chad. Hey, I'm Carl Collier with Collier Drug also with the Dixon Street Merchants Association. Sometimes I want to tell you a little about the structure and it won't take long. You all are familiar with the Dixon Street Improvement District. That is a group of property owners in the district and it's been in existence ever since 1987. It was active in bringing the Walton Arts Center to here. I wanted to tell you the one of the things that its bylaws allow is anything that's conducive toward the economic betterment of the area bounded by the improvement district. So we do have some funds available that along the way, if there's some installation costs, et cetera, our bylaws provide that we can help the city in offsetting some of these expenses uh, it's going to take it'll take a little bit to file a plan with the city clerk etc but one thing i wanted to let you know is that both the improvement district the property owners as well as the dixon street merchants association are supportive of this we liked the idea of the razorback theme i like the fact that it's going to allow you all the city to be more efficient in taking down and putting up your lighting i see there's a good efficiency in that uh, in that part of it can stay up virtually almost year round now the uh, uh another thing that i wanted to let you know is that the dixon street merchants association is forming an umbrella we're, we're forming a, essentially a nonprofit corporation that would allow for Block Street that doesn't have this formal legality to join in with us to form a bigger downtown district encompassing the square, Block Street, Dixon Street. This is all very beneficial for our city, both for city revenues as well as A&P revenues we think that the A&P needs to invest more in our downtown area also. And so we're making a request likewise of them for added funding for projects such as this lighting. But Mr. Tennant is correct. Time right now is of the essence. Let's order in what we have. We have uh, already proposed. Our merchants 
have already at a, at a meeting two days ago already endorsed that they individually want to do a whole lot of decorations on their own and as Joe said that's going to just continue to grow thank you very much thank you Good hey, evening, Jeff. I'm Mayor. Uh, my name is Jeff Herf. I live at 2711 East Woodcliff Road. I reside in Ward 1. Um, just uh, a question, I guess. Did the city consider asking the A&P Commission for the entire amount? Um, looking at their latest balance sheet, they've got $2.5 million in assets, $670 thousand dollars in cash and I'm just wondering this is something in the past they've paid for for additional lights for the lights of the Ozark and I'm wondering why the city is not asking the uh, AMP Commission to spend some of that HMR tax revenue that they are hoarding and accumulating and spend it on something like this rather than having to use city funds potentially you know general fund money um, that might have uh, you know, if we can get A&P to pay, why should the city well, pay? Well, Jeff, I can address some of that. We are basically taking some of the money from the city, and that's true. But I've also got an application in David Whitaker, and he has given us his support to. Yeah, Mayor, I might also add, the city did request funding from the A&P and received approximately 25000 uh, Excuse me, that, they asked for 25000 and got 25000 Um I've got the submission right here if you like. We had two submissions, Jeff. Yeah, two. A, not a single submission, yes. And it was broken down into 10,000 for Block Street for the actual expansion and 15,000 for um, the square. The request that you're looking at, the original $25,000 was for the square alone, and we had an additional request for that. I'll, but the, the, I'll my understanding here. is from looking at the all the submissions that Fayetteville's were, they requested 25,000, 10 for, um, like you said, for animation for a large elm tree or something like that, and then the remaining 15,000 to purchase new LED light strands. Our two council members that are on the AMP, are you familiar with Yeah, no, he can he go home. Well, be that as it may. We have the correct submission, and uh, whenever we were reviewing those proposals, it was my suggestion that rather than am animating the elm tree, we take that $10,000 and offer it to the city to move lights down block. That idea grew to Dixon, which is the request you see before you today in front of the council. And I indicated to the mayor uh, at least twice now that if this uh, funding for, or the request for state funding does not, uh, is not successful, that uh, I've offered to ask the AMP the AMP Commission to contribute uh, at least a little bit more towards this. I'm waiting to see how the, the state funding request goes. The City Council agenda men, uh, memo states that if the GIF request is not obtained, the reserve will not be replenished. So it sounds like there's no plans to go to the AMP Commission if you don't get the money. You're stating that now, it sounds like. Um, AMP Commission could call a special meeting tomorrow, right? Two hour notice to the media, and they get they could vote on this money. I just think uh, I think it, it, I don't think they've been asked for the money, and I think they should be asked. And and if they turn the money down, then you know I guess you could pursue other options. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. No, ma'am. Everybody gets one term less, and Alderman brings you back. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. I'm going to bring you back to the council. We're voting on the amendment right now, correct? Uh, well, I, I just had a question first. Um, is the reason that we are in a rush to get this approved because of the ra specific Razorback theme lighting, and that is why we are limited and not able to do the competitive bidding? Um, I didn't get the quote, so Terry or Connie could speak to that. I think Friday was our deadline to receive the lights. And that's just specifically because of the Razorback theme? I think it was specifically related to the quantity that we were ordering. 
Um, it was not related to just the Razorback. It was to order any type of fixture we wanted, whether it was snowmen. Because mm -hmm. they build them upon the order. Once they got the order, they would, they would build them. We went up to her. They were just gearing up to really for the Christmas season. And mm -hmm. that was the time frame they gave us. If we ordered by now, we would be assured to get them by November 11th, which would give us time to get them up. These will go up much quicker than uh, the normal Christmas lights on the square before they wrap everything because we will mount up two brackets on the pole, on each pole. It'll probably be an installation time of 10 to 15 minutes per pole. So we would have 10 days to get all those up. Okay, but here it says, uh, Get Lit LLC is the only provider of Razorback themed lighting. And whereas time to complete competitive bidding it's not okay. And now, I, now I see that it's it's the time for competitive bidding. Right, I just to we just the, the logo uh, comment in the memo speaks more specifically to the fact that um, the logo has to be a licensed logo. We wanted to use a licensed oriented logo, and this company was licensed to do so. Okay. Vote here. Well, we've got this is uh, this is an ordinance, so. Yeah. I think we have a motion to amend it. Oh, I'm sorry. To amend it to remove the, right. the hog right. lights. Yeah. I'd like Raise to withdraw right my line. second. Huh? I'd like to withdraw my second. Oh, okay. Well, okay, and then we have a, we still have a motion to amend, but it needs a second before we can take any uh, vote on it. Do we have a second on the Okay. Now we're the motion back to fails the original. for lack of a second. Okay. Now we're on the second. So we're on the first, first, first reading. reading. I'm going to spend the rest of the second. Second. I have a motion and a second to go to the second. Okay. Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Hetty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Cutler? Yes. Adams? Yes. Long? Yes. Ed Norris waiving the requirements of formal competitive bidding and approving an agreement with Get Lit LLC. <laughs> For the, in the amount of $51,462 for the purchase of lights for the expansion of lights of the Ozarks to Block Street and Dixon Street and approving a budget adjustment in the amount of $46,500. Move we suspend the rules and go to the third and final reading. Second. We have a motion and a second to go to the third and final reading. Sandra, would you please call the roll? Marsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Hetty? Yes. Tenant? Yes. Shotmire? Yes. Adams? Yes. Long? Yes. And ordinance waiving the requirements of formal competitive bidding and approving an agreement with Get Lit LLC in the amount of $51,462 for the purchase of lights for the expansion of lights of the Ozarks to Block Street and Dixon Street and approving a budget adjustment in the amount of $46,500. Okay. Any final comments from the council? I have one final comment. Yes. And, and I don't want to ask um, Mr. Fennell to, to stand back up, but if he disagrees with what I'm about to say, you can stand back up and, and disagree with me. Um, but we have very popular, um, he has two of them, restaurants down there with, with patios for the summer, and there's lots of activity down there during the summer. And it's always been my interpretation that in the winter months, sometimes things slow down a little bit in those restaurants on Dixon Street. And I would think that this use of this money will bring more people to the Dixon Street area in the winter time, in times where maybe the, the HMR tax base is, is, is not as high because of that and sales tax and everything else. So I would just, I would just uh, wanna say that this will, this will boost in a time that needs boosting sometimes when it comes to restaurants and businesses down there, pharmacies as well. Um, so I, I definitely support this. Any other comments? Well, I want to give you a little history of how we got where we are. I know about six months ago, probably, I went down Dixon Street and was visiting with the businesses down there. Joe and uh, Doug had asked me to come in. They said, well, we had the idea from the Dixon Street merchants to put lights down Dixon Street, and I think I brought up at that time taking them up Block Street. About right, Joe, is that what you kind of remember? Now, we saw this as a real economic driver for this city. Um, so my intent is to be, you know, the thing about the city of Federal is that it is unique. I mean, a lot of folks say, well, why can't we be more like some of the cities to the north? The city of Federal is unique within what it is. 
And one of the things that really makes the city unique is the lights of the Ozarks. And I believe expanding this will help our city economically, and I really believe that the people will look down Block Street. You know, I tell you about Block Street, and I've, I've had my share of, <laughs> shall we say, rankings over Block Street. But I will tell you this, I walked down that street Sunday and looked back at that street, and I thought, what a nice looking street. That's one of the nicest looking streets we have in this city. And everybody knows some of the things that we went through. And I envision seeing the, the garlands around those poles down there and just took for a moment just to think how good that would look down that street. And then, and, you know, when I'd walk down to Dixon Street, you can see that. And you know what? I really believe that the people, when they see that, it creates a real sense of community where everybody believes this is my city. We're partners in this city together. And this is one of the things that makes us unique and makes us great. So it's not only just about being, uh, you know, driving the economic engine in the city, which I believe it will, but I think it really creates community. And it, after the end of the day, it's community building community. So that's all I have to say. I, want, I certainly want to thank Joe and Doug. I have to give them the credit of the idea, though, and, and uh, of the staff that worked on it. And um, maybe we could have done things a little differently. I, I, will, I will give you that. I did the best I know how to do, and here we are. So, yes, say. I just want to say that I really support this program, the idea, and uh, you know, and I, I do intend to vote for it. But. You know, I would really like to see us diversify the appeal of our downtown. You know, we have Razorback themed uh, banners on our light post. We have a, a hog carved into an intersection, you know, and then every other person is wearing a red Razorback shirt. And for those of us who are not sports fans, it can be really alienating. And Fayetteville has more to offer than a sports team. And so um, I really just hope that we can look beyond this and evolve our artistic and entertainment district. Um, to be more than about uh, cheering for a sports team. I think that's a good point. I also want to thank Alderman Tennant and Petty for uh, getting the, fund, the funding from the AMP. And we'll thank you all for doing that. And we have. Uh, Alderman Kenyon, I thank you. And uh, Alderman Petty for. Well, I'm bound to jump up and call the hogs. And, so. and don't, yeah. don't be <laughs> for, <laughs> for co sponsoring this. And thank you all very much for that. So. I don't have anything else. If anybody else have any final comments? Right. Mayor, I just make a comment. We will pursue with the AMP funding yes, we if we do not receive funding through the general improvement fund request. Um, it is not our intention to use reserves of the city right. for this project. Uh, yeah. And those are public meetings. Those AMP meetings. Anyone's welcome to come and share their opinion on what we should do. Okay. All right. Any other comments? Sandra, would you please call the room? Marsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Petty? Yes. Tennant? Yes. Shotmar? Yes. Adam? Yes. Long? Yes. All right. Thank you, Council. All right. What, uh, any, what announcements do we have? Mayor, I'd like to announce that Ward 4 will meet on Monday night, and uh, Dave Johnson from the Public Library will be there to talk about the expansion. Proposals and also we invite everybody from Ward 4 and friends. We invite friends of Ward 4 too. Uh, Monday night, 6 o'clock, room 111 here in City Hall. Yeah. Any other announcements? Mayor, yes, the Historic District Commission meeting that was scheduled for this Thursday, the 22nd, uh, has been canceled. So if you had that on your calendar, I know that meeting's canceled. The Fayetteville Roots Festival, which is August the 22nd through the 25th, it's four days of music and food festival. Um, is coming up, so mark that on your calendar, um, as well as the Fayetteville Fall Festival, which is a new festival scheduled to be uh, August the 30, uh, 31st from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Oh, I'm sorry, the 30th from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. on the Fayetteville Downtown Square. Uh, that's the Friday before our first football game uh, here in the city of Fayetteville. Um, we also want to remind the citizens that the city offices will be closed Monday, September the 2nd, since the council doesn't meet again until after that date um, for the Labor Day holiday. However, our solid waste services will run as re regularly scheduled. Anything else? 
Okay, thank you all very much. We're adjourned.